So I'm Father Seraphim Bell, and uh, I'll give you a little background about myself before launching into this uh, presentation about Nepal. Uh, I did my doctorate in theology in Aberdeen, Scotland, and then began my ministerial life there in Scotland as a pastor in uh, the Church of Scotland, first in Aberdeenshire and then uh, in Edinburgh. Moved back to the States after a few years and entered the Presbyterian Church and uh, served as a pastor in California until I couldn't take being in the Presbyterian denomination any longer, saw the drift where it was heading and left, and in good Protestant fashion, started my own church uh, in uh, the Silicon Valley in California. and started St. Silwan uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, after about 15 years or so there, uh, the Holy Synod appointed me as chairman of the Department of Missionary Work. I started another church also in Washington uh, State, St. John Maximovich. And then Metropolitan Hilarion asked if I would go to uh, the Philippines to do some mission work. At that time, there wasn't, uh, we didn't have a priest there. There wasn't a, a full-time Orthodox priest uh, in the Philippines, but we had people who were ready to be baptized in parishes that needed to be, uh, churches that needed to be uh, consecrated and so on, uh, altars established. And so I went there for a short period of time and then was uh, sent to Nepal. And I lived there for most of the next two years. Until, uh, unfortunately, because of the pollution uh, in Kathmandu Valley, I became ill. Uh, with asthma, and I couldn't find any of the medication that I needed to treat it and was forced to leave, which felt like a great defeat, actually, uh, and a great sadness uh, to me. And then a few weeks later, uh, the great earthquake took place, right, the, the epicenter was right where I was living, in fact. And uh, had I survived the earthquake, I don't know whether I would have survived the aftermath. The people lived on the street, the people in the building that I lived in lived on the streets uh, for the next uh, at least three weeks or so. And if you know anything about Nepal, living on the streets is not conducive to a long life. Um, there's no sanitation, there's no clean water, there was no medical care, food, that sort of thing. So I'm not sure how I would survive that. So I took it as a, uh, a great mercy uh, that God allowed me to leave. Uh, before that struck. Uh, I made, before I went to live there in 2013, I made a couple of trips prior to that. Uh, the first trip was in 2006. When I went to meet this uh, young man, Shubas, who uh, was uh, a young Hindu priest, I found out about this uh, in my visit one of my visits to Vatopedi Monastery uh, on Manathos. I would go each year after, after I'd lived there. For the next many years, I would return each summer and spend some time there. And on one of the occasions, uh, one of my friends who lives there, Father Matthew, who's an American monk at Vatopedi, uh, said after I had just arrived, oh, remind me to tell you about what's happening in, I thought he said India at the time, but I'm sure he said Nepal, uh, tomorrow when we get together. and. Uh, I said, yeah, okay, and walked away and thought, forget that. I'm not the least bit interested in what's happening over there. I had a friend who had been a missionary to India, a Protestant, and he used to tell me stories that convinced me that I would never be called to that part of the world. I wanted nothing to do with that part of the world. Uh, so the next day, um, at the end of the day, he said, oh, Father Seraphim, I forgot again. Remind me tomorrow to tell you about what's going on there. I said, sure, Father Matthew. I walked away and thought, that's never going to happen. The next day he grabbed me early and he said, oh, I've got to tell you, thought, oh, this is the last thing I want to hear about, but go ahead. So he told me that there was this young man who uh, was a Hindu priest living at that time uh, in uh, northern India. He was uh, a very exceptional young man. He, he had quite a following of disciples there. He was a fairly well-known uh, well uh, Hindu priest and well-known because of his skills in astrology. And um, he also was very, uh, I would say, evangelistic. Many Nepalis are forced to leave Nepal to find employment in order to feed the, not only themselves but their families, and they send the money back. And they find work mostly in Islamic countries. 
and uh, many of them were converting to Islam. And this disturbed Shubas uh, a great deal when he heard about it. And so he started traveling to various Islamic countries to bring them back to the fold. And in order to find out why they were converting, he started studying Islam. And when he was uh, spending some time in Qatar, he was reading Islamic materials and speaking with uh, uh, many Muslims there. And he said that he gained the impression that they were very upset about this person named Jesus. Uh, and Jesus seemed like a kind of threat to them and followers of Jesus. And so he would ask them, tell me more about this Jesus. And they said, well, you'll have to find some Christians and read their literature to find out about him. So somehow he came across some Christians uh, there and said he wanted to find out more about Jesus. And they gave him a New Testament. He started reading the New Testament, and he told me that uh, he became Christian. And I said, how did you become a Christian? And uh, I had to ask him several times over a period of days, because initially he would just simply say, from the Word of God, just from the Word of God. And finally I cornered him and said, what in the Word of God caused you to convert? Why would you leave uh, Hindu? Uh, the Hindu faith, in order to become a Christian, a follower of Christ. And he said, because in Hinduism, it's simply an endless cycle, and there is no redemption. And I discovered in Jesus that there's redemption, that there is an end to this psychic, this, uh, this karmic cycle of endless evolution. There is an end, and there is redemption, and I wanted it. And so I became a believer in, in Jesus and a follower of Jesus. He came back to his disciples in New Delhi to share the good news, and they nearly killed him. And so he had to flee with his young family back to Nepal. He went back to his hometown and shared with his family and the community, and they nearly killed him. And so he had to uh, disappear in the larger city, uh, the capital city in Kathmandu. Uh, and that's where I met him in 2006 in Kathmandu. He had, Father Matthew told me that for three years they had been trying to find a priest to uh, go and baptize him and his uh, family, and no one had responded. I should say that he spent a couple of years with some Protestants that he found in Nepal. Most of the Christians that are there are, are Protestants, uh, and it's very indigenous. They were not converted by Westerners, by and large. They, um, the first Christians appeared in uh, Nepal in about 1954. Uh, you go from, from 1950, there were no Christians at all, and then suddenly in 1954, there were a handful of Nepalis who had converted to Christ in India, returned uh, back into Nepal, and began to spread the faith there. And uh, he spent uh, a couple of years with them. But he said that after a couple of years, uh, he felt that it was a very shallow experience. What he said to me was, after you say Jesus is Lord and read your Bible, what else is there? And they had nothing else. That's all that they had to offer. And he came from a, a, a deep tradition, Hinduism, a deep spirituality, and he was searching for something else. <clears throat> so he decided that there must be some other expression, other form of Christianity that he didn't know about. And so he Googled it. You know, he went to the Internet and... Uh, by good fortune, God's grace, he stumbled upon uh, uh, an individual in a blog site, uh, uh, a man from Greece who uh, had lived in America for a time and so spoke and wrote in English and told him about the Orthodox Church. And this fellow sent him some literature. What, what would you send to someone who was inquiring about Orthodoxy? Think about it for a minute, what books you might send to him. I had in mind some things I typically gave to people and probably would have given to Shubas as well. This fellow sent him the Philokalia. That's not what I would have sent to him. And Shubas understood and he laughed. He said, I, I know, Father, I know what you're thinking. He said, but for me, it was the best thing. And I said, well, how can that be? And he said, because as soon as I began reading it, I realized it's too deep for me. I don't understand this. And that's what I was looking for. He was looking for a depth, uh, something that had a depth of spirituality, and he found it uh, in orthodoxy. And he made some connection through this individual in Greece with the monks of Atopedi, and they began to try to help him. Uh, but for three years, they were unsuccessful in finding anyone. And as Father Matthew was telling me this, very much against my will, what was welling up inside of me was, here are my Lord, send me. Uh, I had other priests in my parish um, and so I was free to do some travel 
And so I said to him as he was speaking, okay, Father Matthew, I'll go. And, and he said, what? I said, okay, I'll go. He said, oh, oh, okay. Uh, and so I went. And, um, and when I first landed in Nepal, uh, all kinds of second thoughts came to, uh, flying at me. You know, what have I gotten myself into? What a place uh, to go to. You'd have to go there to understand. But I went to meet this fellow, uh, shoe boss, <laughs> and uh, stopped. This is not Nepal. This is nice, pristine, clean airport in Thailand, in Bangkok. But when I passed through the security gates and saw this, I think it, it hit me for the first time. You know, you're not in Kansas anymore. This is a different experience, a uh, culture that I'd never been to. Now, this is Shubas after he had converted uh, to Christ, and uh, he would return to his old haunts and to his people and try to share the news. He took a picture of this young fellow. This is a, a young sadhu uh, who has... Uh, decided to follow a very ascetic path in Hinduism uh, to become uh, what they call a saint. Um, these are two Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhists that uh, Shubas converted to Christ. Um, there are lots of Tibetan Buddhists in uh, Nepal who have come across the border from, uh, from their homeland. Uh, it's now part of China, of course. And uh, uh, for us, Buddhism is a different religion. We think of Buddhism and Hinduism as, as two different religions, but that's not really the case. Shubhas says only in the West do they think like that. Uh, and the, the closest thing, I think, or, or the easiest way to understand it perhaps is to think of Buddhism as a, as a particular denomination within Hinduism. As, as Shubhas likes to point out, Buddha was a Hindu. He wasn't a Buddhist. He was a Hindu. But his followers took his teachings and developed them in certain ways, and they're called Buddhists now. Uh, but uh, if you go to any of the temples in, uh, in Nepal, you'll see the Buddhists and the Hindus together. If you go to a Buddhist monastery, you see the Hindu shrines and they worship the Hindu deities. Uh, I, I don't have a photograph here, but one of the photographs I have, it shows a group of people who are venerating a large image uh, in one of the marketplaces, uh, an image of uh, the goddess Kali. And uh, standing in line to venerate uh, the goddess Kali are some Buddhist monks as well to make their offering and to venerate this god. So it's, it's really the same religion with just different emphases, a different, maybe a different denomination. But these are Tibetan Buddhists, and the two of them were converted to Christ. Their abbot later, when I came back the second time to ask about them, I found out that the abbot, uh, upon finding that they had been converted, had them kidnapped and taken, to, uh, taken outside Kathmandu Valley to one of the monasteries uh, further up in the Himalayas. These are various sadhus around the, from the Kathmandu Valley. He would go um, particularly to the temple Pashupatanath, and I'll show you some pictures of that, to meet these men and uh, bring them together, give them hospitality, and then share with them from the scriptures uh, and share with them about Christ. He also would go into uh, a nearby country, Bhutan. It's, uh, it's illegal to to enter Bhutan and to evangelize. It's illegal to be convert, to convert uh, to Christ in Bhutan. But he would sneak across the border. There are thousands of uh, Nepali, ethnically Nepali uh, people there, and he would uh, go to visit them. These children have gathered in the middle of the night because this was taken during uh, the civil war in Nepal when the, uh, the Maoists, the communists, uh, were fighting the government. And uh, if Shubas had been by himself, he would have been in great danger of being shot. But with the children around them, they were more likely to leave him uh, alone. <clears throat> Here he's meeting with two of the uh, Bhutanese Nepali Christians. Uh, the man uh, seated in the, in the pink chair uh, opposite him is a fellow who translated the New Testament into uh, Bhutanese. It was my hope that I, I would be able to go with him, but uh, that never worked out. He would go into villages out in the bush uh, in Nepal uh, to evangelize, and uh, 
this is a, one of the first villages that uh, he went to, and he was still very Hindu in his orientation. Um, being a Hindu priest means that he was uh, a Brahmin, the, high class, the highest class of the caste system. The caste system is very much alive in, in Nepal and in India, for that matter, even though it's supposed to have been uh, stamped out. It hasn't been at all. And uh, so as a high-class Brahmin, it was, it was something for him even to go into this village and have anything to do uh, with these people. But uh, he, he went there, and uh, he spent some days and nights with them. And he said on the first night, when they showed him where he was going to, to sleep, the only place they had for him was where they kept the animals. And he laid down on the straw there, and in the dark, a pig jumped off of a little platform had been laying on, on top of him and then walked off. And he, he lay there, this high-class, high-caste uh, Brahmin with this unclean animal that had just jumped onto him. And he said, Jesus, is this what it means to follow you? <laughs> it was quite a shock for him. Uh, but it began to change him as well. And, you know, he thought in his own mind, well, it can't get any worse. This is taken at Pashupatanat, which is... Uh, it's the second holiest place in Hinduism and, and the first holiest place in Nepal. Uh, and uh, this is where the dead are taken to be cremated, among other things. And you see the smoke rising from a funeral pyre. Um, this sludge in front, this river, is uh, considered a holy river. It's the water that eventually runs into the Ganges in India, which is the holy water there. But it, one of the most polluted rivers I've ever seen. Young boys uh, of the lowest gas would be just a little further down uh, stream, waiting for the moment when they would push the body into the river and uh, allow it uh, to be washed downstream. And they would be waiting for this because on the body would be uh, coins and jewelry and that sort of thing. And so they would hope to be able to get, by rummaging through the bones, uh, they would hope to be able to get some of the valuables that would uh, come with the body. These are some of the shrines around Pashupatanath. There are hundreds of different shrines. Uh, individuals will go and make offerings, and uh, women who are... Uh, asking uh, Shiva for a blessing to receive children will come and make offerings in these temples. This is looking back onto the temple complex. It's not one, just, just one temple, but a variety of temples and uh, monastic dwellings, um, monasteries. Uh, it's quite a place. It, it looks much better in the picture than in reality. Uh, things are very unclean there, and you're walking around with the ashes of the burning bodies falling around and the, the smells, and uh, it's not entirely a pleasant experience. Shubas said that he used to think this was the, the holiest of holies, and now he finds it a, a pretty disgusting place to spend time in. He would go there almost every day after his conversion to uh, talk to the people about, about Christ, and he was very successful. His wife also, Kamala, was very active um, in the university in evangelizing among women there, especially among the communist uh, students. As, as, as always happens, the university was full of communist students, and uh, she was very successful in her evangelism there. For him, it was more dangerous, however, coming here, and on one occasion, um, just as you recall, when, when Paul was in jail and his nephew got word of a plot that they were going to kill him and brought word. Well, similarly, uh, a relative of a friend got word, who was still Hindu, got word that there was a plot that the next time Shubas went to Pashupatana to evangelize, they were going to kidnap him and kill him and uh, bring his work to an end. If you can see... Over on the left, there's a, there'll be a close-up. Oh, what does that remind you of? What does that look like? It's more of the funeral power. This is one of the monastic dwellings, and I, I took a picture of it because it reminds me so much of Mount Athos and the kind of monastic dwellings I would see there, the same kind of uh, architecture. And that reminds me of a Russian Orthodox monastery. 
It's a temple within a monastic enclosure there. And a lot of similarities. And for some reason, they didn't understand why I didn't want a, a defanged, smelly snake wrapped around my neck. But I didn't. Uh, we walked on through the other side of Pashupadana into the uh, into the area where the monkey god reigns, and there are all kinds of uh, these monkeys. And these are not tame monkeys. Some of them, I'm sure, are demonic. Uh, you had to be very careful; they would attack you, steal your camera, steal your food, uh, and attack you if you put up any resistance as well. Shubas would come here. I, I showed you a picture of him uh, giving hospitality to some of the sadhus. And uh, many of them lived in this building in the back. And the, the first time he went there, no, no laymen are allowed there. And he went there dressed as a layman. And uh, they wanted him to leave and get rid of him. But he, he began to speak to them and to use Sanskrit, which is a holy language. Just to, for them, just to say, uh, a word in Sanskrit uh, is a holy moment, uh, such as their regard for the holy writ, um, Sanskrit. And when they saw that this layman, they didn't realize he had been a, a Hindu priest, and he was an expert in Sanskrit, having been raised by his grandfather, who was uh, a Hindu priest, and taught him from the time he was a child. Uh, they were shocked that he knew the language uh, of the holy book, and so or the holy books, and so they would, they would uh, motion him to come in, and they would sit. You know, we would hear from you. And uh, so they would bring him in. This is uh, the trident of uh, Shiva. And there's the monkey god himself. This is the area. I, I lived near here uh, in Patan, Darba Square. And this is this big pillar with uh, Shiva on top is no longer in existence, and this temple is no longer in existence. The earthquake brought them down. Uh, they've been there for centuries and survived many earthquakes, but uh, the last couple were too big for them. Uh, the scene doesn't look like this at all anymore, unfortunately. But this is the area that I lived in and would come here on a daily basis. <clears throat> this is a typical street on which I would walk each day past these temple guardians. That's what they would uh, be calling them. This was on a slow day in the streets of Nepal. Uh, this is in the region where the Tibetan Buddhists live in uh, Bodhanat, Baudhanat. These are the, the eyes of Buddha on the top of a great stupa. Um, what this uh, this big white thing with the eyes of Buddha is called a stupa, uh, and uh, it's a shrine that's built over the relics of their saints. Uh, it's interesting to it was interesting to me to find out that uh, that they have saints. It was interesting to me that they venerate their relics, and that they uh, build their shrines over the relics of their saints uh, as well, and. Uh, I took this because uh, it's an illustration of what I was talking about earlier. I'm standing in front of a Hindu shrine in a Buddhist monastery. <clears throat> and these are all Hindu shrines at the Buddhist monastery. <laughs> this is uh, the largest stupa, I think the largest stupa in the world, I'm not sure, in Baudanat. It was a place that I like to come. This is Shubas and his family, uh, Kamala, his wife, and uh, Asma, his daughter, and Shiris, his son. And here with a couple of, uh, of their friends who were also interested in orthodoxy at the time. This is Lakshmi and his family, a long, uh, young lawyer. And uh, Lakshmi believes in Jesus, but he will not confess himself to be a Christian, and he will not make a public uh, profession of faith. And I asked him why, I suspected I knew why, but I asked him why, and uh, he said because it would cost him everything. If he does so, he would lose his profession as a lawyer, he would lose his relationship to his family, and um, I probed a little bit on losing the relationship to your family. In, in Shubas's case, his family cut him off, and that's not uncommon but it's actually more common 
that the converts to Christianity cut their families off, which is a, a great shame. But the Protestant missionaries, uh, unfortunately, for quite a long time in their missionary outreaches, no matter what country they go into, they have very little understanding, it seems, of enculturating the gospel. And so their idea is to go and basically reproduce themselves. So if you see Presbyterian converts in Africa, they're going to look just like Presbyterians in California, and they're going to sing the same hymns, and they'll, they'll be exactly the same in their behavior. They don't enculturate the gospel in any way. And so coming here to Nepal, they would tell the converts to cut themselves off from their family, cut themselves off from their culture. It was all demonic as far as they were concerned. It was a great shame. And Lakshmi said, I, I, I can't cut myself off from my family, and if I lose my profession... Of course, now in Lakshmi's case, I also think he has to count the cost. And, and for the sake of Christ, he has to cross over that line. But he wasn't willing to do that at that point. Uh, that was on the last day of my first visit, and the children were off to school. <clears throat> These are just some pictures taken from uh, the place where Shubas was living at the time, and I stayed there with them. I, ha I had gone thinking in this first visit that I would stay in one of the uh, hotels or hostels around uh, in the Tamil area, which is kind of the tourist uh, area. But then Shubas told me uh, the story of, uh, I, I, I don't want to step on any toes here, but when I, I told you that Vatopedi had tried for three years to get a priest to go and no one would go to Nepal and they had contacted the Metropolitan in Hong Kong many times, but he wouldn't respond to them. Then he found out that I was going, so he immediately sent Father Constantine, who's now Metropolitan uh, Constantine, uh, who flew there and spent a night in the Hilton. And Shubas went to meet him and said, would you like to come to my home and, and meet, meet my followers and, and uh, family? And he said, no, no, it's enough just to meet you and to talk with you. And he left the next day. And that was that. And you can imagine how Shubas felt about that. Uh, he didn't even understand why the fellow came. If uh, why, why did he bother to come if that's all it was? And of course, he was coming to stake claim to the territory because I got an email right after that saying that Paul belongs to us. And if you know the Metropolitan in Hong Kong, then you know that all of Southeast Asia belongs to him. And uh, that was his feeling here that Nepal belonged to him. So I asked Shubas, well, it, it, do you want to work with him? Or, um, you know, is that your understanding? He said, no, he, he spent a night in the Hilton and left, that's all. So, so when I heard that, I thought, well, I'm not even going to go into one of the little hostels in, uh, in Tamil because Shubas wanted me to stay with him and his family. And I felt it was important to stay there, so I stayed there. This was uh, <clears throat> taken, I think, actually during my second uh, visit there. It could have been the first visit, I'm not sure. And uh, we found ourselves in a bit of a predicament. When I arrived in 2006, there was a civil war going on. But Kathmandu, as the capital city, was fairly safe. The armies hadn't come in. Uh, the communist armies hadn't come in. They were called Maoists, but they had nothing to do with China. I don't know how that name got tagged on to them. Uh, but the communists, to this day there, uh, the larger party, are called the Maoists when actually their, their contacts were with the communists in India and uh, a radical group in Peru, if you can believe it. Um, so the Maoists pretty much controlled the western and the far eastern parts of Nepal, but they hadn't managed to break through the, the army's uh, protection of Kathmandu. However, as I said before, there were lots of communists in the university, lots of communist students, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the military wing were starting to infiltrate into Kathmandu through them and starting up demonstrations uh, which would turn violent. And uh, we were driving over to one of the ancient cities in Kathmandu Valley called Bhaktapur and pulled up onto a road in this taxi and all of a sudden found ourselves caught between four different buses of communists who were heading for... I don't know where, but going someplace to cause trouble. This is actually a two-way street, but when the communists are out, it's their way or no way, 
And uh, so they just took over and they would run people off the road, run cars off the road. And we got ourselves boxed in uh, between these buses, which was a little nerve wracking. Um, Shoe Boss was pretty concerned about how dressed as I am, if they got a good look at me, what would happen? But we made it to Bhaktapur, which is uh, one of the ancient cities in Kathmandu Valley. And uh, they took me around. When I moved here uh, in 2013, I would come over to Bhaktapur fairly regularly and uh, eventually met uh, some Christians there. Most of the Christians live outside of Kathmandu, uh, actually, although that's changing. Uh, as the years go on, it's multiplying, and their numbers are multiplying inside Kathmandu. <clears throat> but I found it to be uh, evangelistic simply to walk around. Dressed as I am dressed, people would ask, who are you? What are you? Tell me. And uh, they're very open to hearing about the faith. They're very open to religion. Uh, these are some of the temple guardians, one of the one of the temples. There are dozens of temples around. This is, we were there on a market day. <clears throat> this is the center square in uh, Bhaktapur. I took this because it, it's not always uh, a clear day in Kathmandu. I was there during uh, some of the, the, two of the great uh, holidays that they have, religious uh, holidays, Dasai and, and uh, Tihar. And uh, for a couple of weeks or so, everything shuts down. Everyone goes to their village. And that means there are hardly any cars in the street. Not many shops are open. And so the people aren't driving, which means that the smog uh, lifts and you can see. And I took this picture in particular because Kathmandu sits in a valley. So it, you know that if you're in a valley, you can't see what's on the other side. You're in the valley. All you can see are the walls of the mountains that form the valley. It's not possible to see on the other side unless what's on the other side are the Himalayan mountains. And that's what's on the other side. That's part of the, uh, the Himalayas, as they call them, uh, Himalayan range and the, the snow-covered mountains that are so much higher than the valley that even sitting down in the valley, you can still see them, which is amazing to me. Unfortunately, it's not always this clear, so I didn't often get to see them. We decided to go out of the valley. Shubas wanted to take me to meet some of the uh, uh, Christians that he knew outside uh, of Kathmandu and tell them about orthodoxy. There's only one road in and out of the city, and so as we were trying to go out, the communists had uh, started, they had blocked traffic and they were setting things on fire there. And uh, I was wondering how we were going to get out. And I saw that some, you can't make them out, but I can see that there's some uh, soldiers and police officers that had walked over to investigate. And when they walked over, I thought, oh, good, they'll, they'll clear things out. And uh, they went over, talked a little bit uh, with them. And uh, then they just came back and stood by our buses. I, I asked Shubas, what's going on? Why haven't they cleared them away? And he said, no, they're already afraid. They won't make a move against them. They're already afraid of what's coming. Uh, in, in their minds, they've already given up. And they're looking ahead to the time when the communists control the city, and they don't want to be blamed for having attacked uh, this first wave of communists who have come in. And so they let the protests go on. Traffic was stopped, but our bus driver wound around through a neighborhood and we came out on the other side and we're able, I'm, I'm looking back now at the roadblock and uh, we're heading out of the valley. And we climbed out of the valley and uh, after a while stopped at this roadside stop so that the people could get, could get uh, some food and uh, I was going to get something to eat. I hadn't eaten all morning until I noticed that a young boy was washing the dishes right next to the outhouse at the stream. So I thought I would call it a fast day, and we'll wait. It just seemed a little safer to me. We drove to uh, Lumbimi, which is the birthplace of Buddha. I didn't know that Buddha was born in Nepal. He wasn't born in India. But he was born in Nepal. And uh, this whole area near his birthplace, or around his birthplace, has been uh, set aside 
as a, a memorial to him, and, uh, and now the government's turning it into a kind of uh, Buddhist Disneyland in a way. I mean, not with rides or anything, but all the Buddhist countries are building uh, temples. Um, I think this temple is the Vietnamese temple, uh, and uh, it's quite a large complex. This is the... Uh, the Thai government built this uh, temple. It's a beautiful building. It was, I commented to Shubas that I noticed right away there was a difference between uh, what I perceived sensually in, uh, near a Hindu temple. I wasn't allowed to go into a Hindu temple. Only Hindus are. But you could enter into the Buddhist temples. In the, around the Hindu temples, I always felt a, a, a demonic spiritual activity, sometimes very powerful. At Pashupatanad, it was almost overwhelming to me. Uh, I had to find a place to sit down. I, I felt uh, dizzy and disoriented, and, and uh, until we could spend some time in prayer, uh, I couldn't uh, even go on. It was a very powerful demonic uh, experience, and, and that's something that I encountered many times in, Buddha, in a Hindu context. But in the Buddhist temples, there was simply an emptiness. Um, it was just a, a clean, sterile building. There wasn't any, anything uh, uh, even of a spiritual nature, negative or positive. I'm not sure why that is, and maybe that was just my experience. When we left that area, we came back to uh, our, the town that we were staying in, and uh, our taxi was stopped far from the city center and uh, no traffic was moving. We, we got a rickshaw and made part of the way for, uh, for, with the rickshaw, and then we had to walk the rest of the way, uh, and found another rickshaw and, and came and discovered this uh, communist gathering going on right in front of our hotel. And so uh, this is why all the traffic was stopped. <clears throat> and uh, we came to find out that they from, since the last time Shubas had been there, the, the communists had taken over this area, and this was one of their strongholds, and so they were having a big rally at this point, and he said, wait here, I have to pay the rickshaw uh, driver, and then we'll go into the hotel. And so I walked over near this meeting. I felt so much anger about this, because uh, being in the West and knowing the history of communism, uh, their, their promises are empty. You know the routine they're going to give. They're go in a poor nation, they're going to give them everything. They're going to give them free education. They're going to give them food. They're going to give them jobs. They're going to give them health care. Uh, and you know the empty promises. And what they don't tell them is they're also going to enslave them. And I was infuriated by it. And uh, as I watched it, I realized everywhere I had gone, wherever I walked, the people would stop and turn and look at me. Uh, any, not because of me, but the way I'm dressed, any, uh, a Westerner uh, in these clothes and with a cross uh, is unusual there. So they would stop. And I realized, you know, all I have to do is go walk in the middle of them and I can shut this thing down. They're all going to turn and I don't know what happens after that, but I can disrupt the thing. And so I started and then I felt a hand on my shoulder and Shubas says, I know what you're thinking, Father. Don't do it. We have to think about our wives and families. <laughs> And he used to do that sort of thing all of, all of the time, of course, until Kamala begged him no longer to go uh, into... Uh, I, I didn't tell you about this, but Shubas had forged some journalistic uh, credentials. And he would go into the military camp, the communist military camps in the hillsides uh, all over Nepal and uh, present himself as a journalist who wanted to interview uh, the commander and he would interview him and his soldiers. And then during the course of the interview, he would turn it around to share about Jesus. And he was successful in converting some of the soldiers uh, as well. He was also successful with escaping with his life on some occasions. But uh, he would do that fairly regularly until Kamala finally begged him, no more, you have two young children, you have me, what am I going to do without you, you know, if they kill you? So for her sake, he stopped it and uh, thinking of my family, uh, he said, we have to think about the family, Father. Let's go back to the hotel. So, so we did. <clears throat> but I found it infuriating. At the back of the hotel is this small temple. Uh, this was started by Shubas's grandfather, who I told you earlier was uh, a Hindu priest. So Shubas knew this area well. And we met this man while we were there. And uh, I want to read from my notes that I made. I... 
when I met him, and there are a couple of other fellows uh, that I met, <clears throat> I wanted to know why they became uh, a Christian. Uh, I met this man, Suk, and uh, found out that he had been a Buddhist Lama, and I didn't find out how he was converted to Christ. Uh, I, I, if I recall, he had, a, he had an uncle who uh, converted him, and he became a believer in Christ, but he and his family were beaten. They, lived in a, they were Buddhists. He was the Lama, and so they lived in a Buddhist village, and the, the Buddhists turned on them and beat them and drove them into the hillsides they, where they had to live in caves uh, for about a year until they discovered that in another village far away, they heard rumors that there were Christians who lived there. And so they went to that village, and it was predominantly made up of Christians who had had to flee their villages as well. They finally found each other and started more or less a Christian village, as it were. And they lived there for a time. Uh, after the war was over, some of the men who used to beat him came to him and said that they wanted to follow Jesus as well. And so became, uh, he's now a pastor, and they became part of uh, his church. Uh, I met this fellow the next day, and I want to make reference to my notes here, because I, I asked him how he became a Christian, and he did tell me. He explained, he explained to me that uh, he also was a Buddhist Lama, and that he had become ill with cancer, and he reached the last stages uh, before his death that uh, they sent him home from the cancer clinic back to his village because there was nothing more they could do for him. And uh, the cancer was at such a stage that it, was, it had already devoured some of his ribs and was devouring some of the organs. And he was in extreme pain, and they didn't expect him to live very long at all. His wife immediately sought help uh, through witchcraft and shamans and uh, nothing uh, helped him. And one day there was a, a Christian pastor who, a Nepali Christian pastor, who uh, found her along the roadside crying, uh, knowing that her husband was about to die, and uh, explained uh, the situation to him. And he said to, he told her about Jesus. And uh, he said, perhaps, he didn't promise her, but he said, perhaps if your husband would accept Christ, that he would, he would heal her as well. We call him the great physician. Perhaps he would heal him uh, as well. And so she went to, home, to her home, and she told her husband about it, and he rejected it out of hand and wanted nothing to do with it. But the next day, the pain was so great that he said, please bring him. I'm willing to try anything, anything. And so the pastor came and told him about Jesus, and he accepted Christ, and he said immediately he felt peace and some relief from the pain. But the next morning... He awakened and rose up from his bed completely well. He was completely healed. Uh, but that began a time of persecution. Uh, for the next month, um, he was spat upon. He was often beaten. He was not allowed. In, in a village, in these villages, you have to understand, there's, there's one place you go to get drinking water. But he was denied access to that. There's one place that you go to buy goods, foodstuffs, to, to survive, and he was denied access to that. So just trying to survive now was uh, uh, a daily task and, and challenge. And after a month, a uh, tragedy struck again. His young son had climbed up into a tree and fell, and he broke his leg uh, near the hip, and he also broke his arm. <clears throat> and they're way out in the bush. Uh, it, takes a couple of days to get even to a clinic, let alone any kind of hospital. Hospitals really didn't exist out in the bush. They, you'd have to go to Kathmandu for that. And by the time they were finally able to get him uh, to see a physician, he was examined and they said, there's nothing we can do. The, the wounds are too old. The bones grew back. The leg was deformed and turned up and the arm was useless and he had to hobble uh, on a crutch and there was nothing that could be done for him. Uh, they eventually took him to Kathmandu and had him examined, and the doctors at the hospitals in Kathmandu told him the same thing. These are old wounds. There's, there's no way that we can help him. Uh, it's gone on too long. They met there a Korean Christian physician uh, on the streets by happenstance, and uh, they explained the situation to him, and he examined the boy and said, what they've told you is, is true. 
But perhaps if you fast and pray, God will hear your prayers and heal your son. And so they returned to their village, to their home, and they set aside three days to fast and pray. They ate and drank nothing for three days and prayed for their son. And on the third day, they watched as his leg straightened out and lengthened, and his arm was still useless, but his leg became well. And the son jumped up and was running around the village to the amazement uh, of everyone, came back home, and they celebrated. They had a, a nice feast, and then they said, you know, maybe if we fast and pray for three days, the Lord will heal his arm as well. So they fasted and prayed again for three days and watched as his arm straightened out and became well. And he went out running around the village. This completely shocked the villagers who had been persecuting them uh, for all of these months. And the, the, uh, the head of the village gathered everyone together and said, clearly this God of theirs is a powerful God. No one touched them anymore. <laughs> they didn't want what they thought could happen to them, the same sort of thing that they had been doing to this man. Uh, when he was telling me the story, uh, not about himself being healed from cancer and his organs being restored, but when he was telling me about his son, uh, tears were falling from his eyes. It was a very moving time. Uh, when the village chieftain said, uh, clearly their God is a powerful God, do not touch these people anymore, at that point, permission was given for the villagers, or they felt free. It's not as if actual permission was given, but they felt free to come to him uh, and say that they too wanted to be a follower of Jesus. And so now he's a pastor uh, in, that, in that same town. Uh, this is another uh, fellow that I met. I don't recall his name. Um, let's see if I have his story. Yeah. When I asked him how uh, he had become a Christian, uh, it, one of the things that was interesting to me is as I said to you early, earlier, these people did not become Christians through Western missionaries. It was very much an indigenous work. Nepalis who had been converted in India came and shared the gospel with them. But many times it was through this uh, miraculous means where the Lord himself uh, would do something such as you just heard, uh, a wonderful healing that would lead the family uh, to Christ. Um, this fellow had something similar uh, happened to him. Uh, let's see if I can find it. He said that he was converted when he found uh, a Christian tract, a, a writing on the road. He was walking along the road and he saw it lying on the road and picked it up and read it and he was moved by it. Uh, then he became very ill, um, deadly ill, and one night, in his illness, he had a dream. And in the dream, the pastor who had left the track on the side of the road appeared to him and uh, told him to rise up and be healed. And the next day, when he awakened and thought about that, he tracked down the pastor uh, in another village and told him about the dream. And so the pastor laid hands on him and prayed for him, and he was healed and he converted to Christ. His father was the village sorcerer, though, and was not particularly happy about his son's conversion. Became very angry with him, would persecute him, would beat him. Other villages, this is very common, other villagers uh, would beat him as well, um, as happened to the other men uh, that you heard about, until his mother became very ill. And his father, being the sorcerer, assumed that he would be able to heal her, but he wasn't able to heal her. Nothing he tried uh, worked, and she became progressively worse. And finally, in a very disgusted manner, he went into his son and said, see if your God will do anything for your mother. And so he went over and prayed for her and laid hands on her, and she was healed. And as a result, she and the father converted to Christ. And in time, other villagers converted to Christ. And now uh, he has a small church there in the village. But uh, the persecution continued from uh, another source. The communists moved into his village and they took over uh, the church. Uh, in all of the villages where they would take over, they would shut down uh, the school and uh, drive the teachers away and they had propaganda 
they call it propaganda hour, but it would end up being the, the entire morning and part of the afternoon as well, where they would bring the youth in and just indoctrinate them with their uh, communist uh, propaganda. And <coughs> in his case, uh, this, this fellow, you know, he's one of the toughest men that I've ever met. He's one of the strongest men I've ever met. Uh, they simply could not break him. Uh, he would not help them. He would not cooperate with them. They would beat him within an inch of his life, and he wouldn't give up the faith. Um, uh, they, were, he would, they would throw him in a, in a kind of jail that they had and try to starve him. He escaped from it and lived in a cave for six months until they moved out of the village for a time, and he moved, he moved uh, back to be with his family again. Uh, then they came back in again uh, and uh, arrested him and, and beat him. Several times he escaped. They finally sent him far out uh, up into the hills uh, to one of their uh, base camps, which they call it a base camp, but it was ba basically a concentration camp, a labor camp. And uh, he was there for six months before uh, he managed to escape. And uh, the last time they had been in his village, they, they told him, when we win the war, and take Kathmandu, we'll come back for you, and we'll destroy this church, and we'll kill you. But he, he didn't seem to be the least bit intimidated. So after visiting uh, with them, we headed out on the most dangerous uh, part of the stay, which is just traveling someplace in Nepal. Uh, that's the scariest part. The, the drivers are insane. I think that's one of the requirements uh, to drive uh, a bus there is insanity, and uh, they care nothing for the life of other people. I watch bus drivers drive over children on bikes, uh, smash into cars, and we were we were way up. I, I, I don't understand how they managed to sit up there on the right. Have you ever been in a bus and been on two wheels? I, I have lots of times, and it's a very unpleasant experience. And uh, we're right on the edge of the road, and you look down hundreds and hundreds of feet to this tiny stream, ribbon of a stream down there. I remember uh, the first time, uh, and Shubas leaned over and looked at me, and he looked out the window, and he said, the buses like to swim in the rivers here. And, and they do. Every week, buses drive right over the side of the cliff, uh, and the people on top of them, everyone inside of them, uh, are killed. Um, they seem to have... No concept of the importance of life. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to really matter for them. But it's a frightening experience. And we were on a bus for many hours to get to this village. It's a, a refugee camp uh, for Nepalis who have been driven out of Bhutan. There is an ethnic cleansing going on in Bhutan for quite a few years. Nepalis, uh, you know, borders are somewhat artificial. Well, this is a big issue in our country right now, but borders are somewhat artificial. And Nepalis were spread out and suddenly woke up one day and discovered they were living in another country and they were not welcome in that country, even though they had been living there for centuries. Um, the Nepalis in Bhutan are being driven out and have been for the last number of years. There were about, at the time I was there, the first time, there were about 100,000 in three different uh, refugee camps. And we were going to visit uh, one of the Christians who was a Christian pastor uh, in this refugee camp. You see these uh, these huts that the people live in. The Nepali government receives millions of dollars from the West for the refugees, to build houses for them, to give them clothing, to give them food and medicines. And how much do you think actually gets to the refugees? Virtually nothing gets there. It lines the pockets of the politicians. And so they're forced, the government didn't build these little huts for them. The refugees themselves wove these out of bamboo slats and uh, in the winter, they're living inside of these things. Uh, with the winter storms, there's flooding. In fact, when I was there, there had been a major flood and the bridge had been washed away. So we had to wait to a, for a particular time of day when the river was low and, and cross on foot across the river. Uh, other times we would just jump from one jagged piece of the bridge to the other to get across. That was the only way they could get to the main town uh, where they could locate some food or medicine if they had any money to do so. <clears throat> this is their sanitation hut. So Shubas wanted me to meet this one individual, this uh, pastor who next to his little hut had built this small church for his people. 
where he held daily services in the morning. <clears throat> and this is the pastor. I was deeply impressed with this man. Um, I, I felt that uh, in his presence, I was standing in the presence of a very godly man. I asked him how he spent his day. They, they had their prayer meeting in the morning. But um, there are no, there's no employment for him. There was no job. Uh, and, uh, and the others would go to do whatever they had to do to try to survive through the day. And I said, what do you do? What do you do with your time the rest of the day? And he sort of looked down and he said, you might not understand this, but I pray for everyone in the world. I don't know them and will never see them, but God knows them and knows what they need. And I pray for them. Who does that sound like? St. Siloan the Athenite. I, I, I was amazed. I said, no, I do understand this. I do understand it. Not experientially, but I read about it from St. Saint, uh, Siloan. And I was very impressed with him. The next time I went, I wanted to meet with him, uh, but he was dead. Uh, he had diabetes, and the government never gave him any of the medicine that uh, he needed. Uh, he, I didn't know it, at the t but at this time, he was, he was dying at this time, but you would never know it. Uh, there was such a peace about him. Um, as I say, he was such a godly man, and this is uh, his wife. Uh, we went into their home, and there's, there's the wallpaper. There are bamboo slot, slats and then newspapers. And there are going to be hurricane-strength winds blowing through there every, every winter, uh, freezing rain blowing through there uh, every winter, and that's all they have. Uh, it's a dirt floor. They had, I think, two chairs and a, a little slat that they called a bed that they lived on. Um, to make the tea, there was, you know, they had a little, they just had a little pot and made a little charcoal fire on the floor in what was called their kitchen behind that curtain. This is one of their spiritual daughters and her two sons. Her husband was, was in some other country working uh, to try to support them, but they hadn't heard from him in about two years. So they didn't know whether or not he was even alive. From there, we went to another village. Uh, pretty far away, there was a fellow who wanted to hear about orthodoxy. Uh, Shubas had been telling them about uh, the Orthodox Church, and uh, so Shubas wanted me to go and meet him. And so the next day, we went uh, out into the wilds uh, to meet this fellow. And we were on a bus, and suddenly, uh, it pulled over kind of in the middle of nowhere and stopped, and we got off to meet this fellow. And I asked, asked Shubas, why are we stopping here and not in the village? And he said this fellow had come out to warn us. Um, we thought we were just going to meet with him and his people. He has a small church, but it turns out that there was uh, a big shot who was going to be there. He was kind of, they don't have titles, but you could think of him as a kind of uh, district supervisor. He was in charge of the Christians in 13 other villages, uh, and then he had his own village church as well, and the pastors were his spiritual sons. Uh, he had converted them and discipled them and, and placed them in these villages, and uh, he had found out Shubas was pretty well known. Uh, it's not real common for uh, a high caste, a, a Brahmin priest to uh, convert, and so he was pretty well known as a convert to Christianity, and uh, so he wanted to come and uh, hear what Shubas had to say and heard that this Westerner was coming as well to talk about something called orthodoxy. And so he wanted to hear about that. And so I said, well, what's the problem? And Shubas said, don't talk about orthodoxy. Don't say anything about it. I said, why? He said, because if he doesn't like what he hears, then he will turn the officials on us. I'll get into trouble and you'll be thrown out of the country and won't be able to come back. So just talk about something else. And I thought, I said, what else am I going to talk about? This is who I am. I, so I, I had no idea. So as we walked there, I was praying about uh, what I should tell them. Uh, we climbed up into this, climbed up into this uh, little shack that they had built, which was their chapel. And uh, these are this, this was a portion of the of the parishioners. And then this is the district supervisor. And Shubas uh, leaned over to me and said, he didn't come alone. His 13 disciples are with him as well. And uh, the, uh, the young men uh, had come to hear what Shubas had to say and what I had to say uh, as well. And so I spoke with them. Uh, and 
when I finished, Shubas turned to me and said, so you decided to tell them everything. Uh, and, and I did. I went ahead and shared about the Orthodox Church. And the response uh, from this fellow was uh, that he wanted immediately to come to Kathmandu to see our church. He wanted to be Orthodox. Let me see your church. And, of course, there was no church in Kathmandu or anywhere else in Nepal. Uh, that was the great problem that I always ran into. I met dozens and dozens of people who wanted to become Orthodox. As soon as they would hear about the church, they wanted to be a part of this. This is what they were looking for. This is what they wanted. Let me come to your church. Where do you worship? I had that question all the time. I hated that question. I, I worship in my bedroom, you know, doing my prayers by myself. There's nothing to show you. There's nothing here. Uh, and then that raises all kinds of questions as well. How can that be? If this is the church, how can it be that it's not here? Because there are Christians here. It's a, it's a difficult situation. This is the pastor's home. Shubas wanted me to see how he and his wife and children live in this one room. So he lifted up. There are no windows to the place in his. There are windows in the other places. Here's the house next to him. That's their living quarters. That's everything. From there, we, we hired a, what we thought was a four-wheel drive vehicle, and it wasn't. It just looked like one, unfortunately. And we spent hours trying to get to another village that Shubas wanted to take me to. We, we spent an hour or so following this dirt road into the bush, only to find our way blocked by boulders. And Shubas and the driver couldn't move the boulders, so we had to double back and, and spend another four hours going another way. Sometimes the, the trail would just disappear. Uh, into the jungle, and we would press on. We crossed I don't know how many streams and two, uh, two rivers and finally got to this little village way out into the jungle. It had been raining, and the car was constantly getting stuck. And, and In fact, we couldn't get by car into the village, finally had to get out. It got stuck, and we had to get out. And uh, Shubas wanted to, me to meet this fellow, Mani, Mani Ram, uh, and his family and uh, some of uh, the people who worship uh, with him and tell them about orthodoxy. So I spent some time with them. Um, one of my cross-cultural experiences was accepting what they could give you to eat or drink. You know, the people have nothing. And so what all they had to give was a cup of tea. And they set it down next to me. And uh, as, as we were speaking, Shubas and I, and I noticed that it had been raining all of the time, of course, and I noticed that the rain was coming through the thatch roof and dripping into our tea. And I knew what was coming, you know, the Nepali version of Montezuma's revenge if I drink this tea. But if I don't drink this tea, I offend them. So I drank the tea and we visited the clinic the next week um, to find some antibiotics to take care of that. This is Mani and his family. And this was the car that we thought was four-wheel drive and wasn't. We finally, on, on the way out, it took us about an hour to get out of the village because it was stuck in the mud, which is like a clay, and a, a lot of the villagers had to push, and they would, they would push, and after about 10 minutes, get us out of that rut, and we would go five feet and get, in, get stuck again. And it was like that for about 45 minutes, getting out of the village, I think. Finally, when we got to one of the streams, uh, we stopped so we could wash the the car off and wash ourselves off. Well, I didn't have to wash myself. They wouldn't let me help uh, since I was the guest. Um, but uh, shoe boss was from head to toe mud and he had to clean himself. The driver wasn't too happy, but he wasn't too unhappy either. He was very Nepali. And we started, uh, we hired an, uh, we didn't want to go by bus. Shoe boss said it was just too frightening. Uh, the the bus drives that we had had, and they were frightening, as, as I said earlier. So we hired uh, an alternative way of going was uh, with a Toyota uh, uh, Land Rover and some other passengers, and uh, he was hopeful that it would be a little safer, and we started climbing out of the valley and up the mountains to come down the other side into Nepal. And uh, it was uh, rainy, the road was like wet clay, uh, slippery. This is one of the vans meeting us on the other way. The road would be narrower than this at times, and you would be trying. A bus would be coming one way, and you come in the other way, and you try to figure out how on earth you're going to get by. And uh, so we got higher and higher. <coughs> you can see the rain on the windshield there, and uh, 
There's no way to capture on film the frightening experience. As it turned out, this was not a better alternative. Uh, this was just uh, a variation of the same. In fact, Shubas said, I'm never going that way again. And, and he's Nepali. <clears throat> but it, it was uh, a clay, slippery clay ribbon of death. I took a picture here where a car went over the side. Uh, <clears throat> you can see kind of, kind of the, see the gravel where it's upset in the middle there. A car went over uh, there not too long before we arrived. And uh, one of the passengers was killed. One of the passengers was still alive. And so they sent for an ambulance. Can you imagine how long it, it had to take for what passed as an ambulance to get there forever? But he was still alive when they got there. And they managed to bring him up. And uh, the two ambulance drivers got him into the back of the ambulance. And uh, then they drove off and went over the side. And they all died. And that was just uh, another day. Uh, on the roads in Nepal. It was like that all the time. We stopped at a, a mountain village along the way, get something to eat. Very beautiful area. Um, and we finally came out the other side, and these fellows were waiting for us to pass. They were just going to start the journey. And they, we had been, I don't remember, it was two or three hours uh, creeping along on this slippery road where we were frightened to death the whole time. And I looked and saw these guys smiled and waved as we went by, and I thought, you're smiling and waving, and you're going to ride for the next two to three hours on this road to death. Uh, and, but that's, that's how it was every day, and uh, they didn't think any different of it. They didn't think anything unusual about it, but it was pretty frightening for me. Uh, and that's the end of that. <clears throat> so in 2006 was my first visit there, 2007. I don't know how I am on time. I'm over time. Do I have? Okay. Uh, 2007, I went again. I didn't baptize him in 2006. What became clear, although they sent me to baptize him and his family, I realized, first of all, they hadn't been thoroughly catechized at all. It was much too soon for baptism. But then the other thing that struck me was baptize them into what? I, I mean, it would have been easy for me to baptize them and then leave them. There's no church there. There's no priest there. They have no one to instruct them. They have no place for fellowship. Uh, it didn't seem the best course. It didn't seem wise, a wise thing to do. I went back in uh, the next year, 2007, and spent a longer period of time there catechizing them and catechizing some of the other people. And uh, I took a deacon with, well, actually, he joined me at the end of my uh, trip, a uh, deacon from my church, uh, Deacon Silwan. He's now Father Silwan, who is... Uh, some of you may know Father Silwan Thompson, who's a missionary priest in the Philippines. So I took uh, Silwan along with me uh, to help with baptisms. And every day we were put off. Every day there was some reason we couldn't do the baptisms. And, and uh, after a, about a week, I finally took Shubas aside and kind of forced him to tell me what was going on. It's very difficult. Uh, I think this is, uh, this, this is somewhat characteristic of all of Southeast Asia. Um, saving face is very important. They don't want to embarrass you. They don't want to, to lose face themselves. And uh, so they don't want to displease you. And so it's very difficult for them to tell you something that perhaps will upset you. And he didn't want to tell me what was really going on. What was really going on was uh, difficulty with Kamala, his wife. When he had uh, left Hinduism to become a Christian, his wife didn't follow him. She was adamantly opposed. And it took two to three years before she finally uh, consented to become a Christian, and probably longer than that for her to actually uh, really believe in her heart. She was, she was uh, opposed to that and for lots of reasons. You know, it cost her, her family cut her off completely. We tried to visit her family when I was there, and they wouldn't have anything to do with us. Uh, we, did, we, we, we went to one sister's house, Shubas and I, and uh, I, I was really sorry we went. I told Chubas, I don't want to try to do that again because she was scared to death the whole time we were there. She was scared to death that the rest of the family would come and find us there with her and she would suffer the consequences. And I said, I don't want to put her in that kind of situation. But uh, she had lost her family. She hadn't seen her family uh, in years. Uh, so now Chubas was asking her to do something uh, that seemed to be too similar to leave the faith that she knew as a Protestant and become Orthodox. 
But there were no other Orthodox Christians in Nepal. There was no Orthodox Church in Nepal. What was she going to? She was going to give up everything and go to what? Just the two of them in their bedroom and that's it? Uh, it didn't make sense to her. She didn't understand the necessity for it. Uh, she wasn't convinced at all. And, uh, and it, while it's true on the face of things that uh, the Hindu culture in Nepal is a patriarchal society, uh, the other truth is behind closed doors, it's a matriarchal society in, in many cases as well. And so uh, Kamala carried a great deal of weight there, and there was no way she and the children were going to come with him if he was going to make this move, and he didn't want to tell me that, so he kept putting us off. <coughs> so no baptisms took place in 2007. I made arrangements to come back in 2008, and then two things happened. One was um, I injured my knee and needed surgery, <coughs> But at the same time that that happened, the same week, I got a phone call from Chubas who said, you can't come, it's too dangerous. Uh, the communist uh, military had broken the, the government and had entered into Kathmandu, and they were in charge now, and uh, all hell had broken loose at that point. Christians were being killed. It's, thank you, Pablo. Uh, it wasn't safe uh, to be there. Even when I had been there, 2006, 2007, he used to say, I'm not comfortable with you dressing like that. You know, take, take your cross off, take your cassock off. And, which, and I, just, I said, I'm not comfortable dressing like you want me to dress, so I'll, I'll stay like this. And by God's grace, I didn't have any uh, difficulty when I was there. But he said, don't come in 2008, let's see what happens. <clears throat> so I spent the next few years trying to get him out of Nepal to study uh, at a seminary. We tried to get him here several times. Uh, and it didn't work because I, I remember the last time he tried, uh, it, was, it was the same week that Georgia, pushed by our government, invaded uh, Abkhazia and Ossetia in the war. There was a brief war between Russia and uh, Georgia. And when he went into the American embassy in Nepal, uh, the, uh, the embassy official simply threw his application at him and said, we don't like Russians wasn't a very educated response. I mean, uh, I'm not Russian. Uh, Shubas isn't Russian. He was wanting to come to America, but it was to the Russian Orthodox uh, seminary, and that was all he needed to see was Russian on it, Russian Orthodox, and so he simply threw his application in his face, and that was the end of that. So then we tried to get him into Russia, and <clears throat> we never had any problem on the church end. I mean, there was a scholarship waiting for him and a place for him to come to seminary, but uh, there was always a bureaucratic problem, uh, and it, the process would break down and he'd have to start again, which was an expensive process for him. We tried Romania, we tried in Greece, nothing was working out. And so finally in, in 2013, as I mentioned earlier, I moved back uh, there, and uh, <clears throat> I had talked to him on the phone a couple of times before moving there. I got there and I expected to spend time with him and to actually to be working with him. And I didn't see him uh, until the day before I left. Um, I had left a suitcase with some things uh, with him. And uh, partly I, I did that as, uh, as a need to see him again, a way, a way to see him again. And so I phoned him and said I, I needed to get that suitcase from him if possible. And, uh, he said, yes, he'd bring it next weekend. It came and went, and we did it again. It came and went. Finally, Kamala showed up with her son, Shirish. And then I realized what was going on. Uh, Kamala had put her foot down, and she wasn't even going to let Shubas come and see me. She didn't even want us to be together, to speak together. So the entire time I was there, I was not able uh, to meet them until just before the day before I left, I called them up and said, I'm leaving <clears throat> the country. Uh, I've got to go get some medical treatment. I've got a suitcase full of things. You know, I'm still scheming that maybe one day uh, uh, I or someone will come back for that suitcase uh, and have to see him. Uh, because I know in Shubas's heart, he wants to be Orthodox. I know, I know what Shubas believes. I know where he is. Uh, the the uh, stumbling block at this point is with Kamala and her determination not to be a part of it. Uh, and she, she has a strong case because uh, at the moment, we still have no Orthodox presence um, in Nepal. Uh, it's a very frustrating situation because the people are so open. 
And I, I feel like we haven't entirely missed the opportunity, but we, we've, we missed the most opportune time, but it's still a good time to plant uh, churches there in Nepal. But a small team needs to go. I went by myself, <clears throat> and my belief is you never go by yourself. It's foolishness to go by yourself for lots of reasons. But my understanding was that I would be working with Shubas, and also there were quite a number of people who said that they were going to come and help. I had laymen and priests who uh, were going to come uh, and help, and no one ever came. No one ever showed up. And uh, being there on your own is not advisable at all. Spiritually, it's not healthy. Uh, you don't have access uh, to the liturgy. You can do reader services, but uh, you don't receive the Eucharist. And um, you know, when one is when one is down, another can lift him up. But if there isn't another there to lift him up, you just kind of keep going down, down, down. It's a it's quite a struggle, and it's intense spiritual warfare there. Uh, it, spiritual warfare is something real. It's we in a way that we don't typically encounter it here in the West. <clears throat> Let me tell you about uh, my my language teacher Umesh, who was my Nepali teacher. Uh, I never spoke to Umesh about the faith. He had taught Nepali to a number of Western uh, missionaries uh, through the years, and they were always trying to convert him, he told me. And so I determined that I was simply going to relate to him as a person, not as a, a potential scalp on my belt. And uh, he was my Nepali teacher, and we became friends. But the thing is, he would always ask me about orthodoxy. Uh, he was expecting me to come forth with it, and I wouldn't, so he was always asking me questions. You know. What is baptism? What really happens in baptism? What, what does it mean, resurrection? Tell me about resurrection. I, I was amazed at some of the questions, and uh, wonderful questions and wonderful opportunity. He said to me at one point, uh, I can never become uh, a Christian. And I asked him why, and he said, uh, because I, I would have to cut off all of my family. And it's what I talked about earlier. The, the, the Nepali Christians that he knew had cut their relationships with, off with their family because the Western missionaries had told them they had to. The entire culture is demonic, so you have to cut yourself off from it completely. And uh, once again, Tihar and Dasai, the two great festivals, came along. And the main thing that takes place in those festivals is that the entire family gets together for at least two weeks. There are two special weeks. And for those two weeks, they have daily meals together. The women are together the whole day preparing the meals and catching up on all the family history over the past year, and the men are together. It's a wonderful family time, and there are offerings that are made to the gods, which, of course, I said, you couldn't do that as a Christian, but why couldn't you have the meals with your family? Why couldn't you be with your family? And everything culminates on the last day when the people come to their father, the patriarch of the family. They make a prostration before him. He blesses them and then anoints them with the tikka, the red dot. Why wouldn't you want the blessing of your father? What prevents you from having your father's blessing? Certainly not Christ. Well, that's what the missionaries have always said. We can't go there. We can't eat with them. We can't have the blessing. We have to cut ourselves off from them. The more he would hear about orthodoxy in our understanding of the faith, the more interested he was, the more intrigued he was, until one day, in, in the midst of one of our lessons, I think what brought it up was, and this gives you an idea of the culture. In the, in the lessons, I was learning the Nepali words for witch, shaman, demon, possession, uh, deliverance. And that, that tells you that they bothered to teach you those words is because that's a, a fairly common experience. Those are fairly common experiences in that culture. So in the midst of that lesson, uh, Shuba stopped and he said, Father, I know Jesus is true. I said, how do you know Jesus is true? And he said, let me tell you, one day some friends of mine called, uh, very frightened. Uh, one of their friends, it wasn't a friend of Umesh's, but, but a, a mutual acquaintance, uh, was demonized. And they had been trying for three days to rid this woman of the demon, and nothing had worked. The shamans they brought hadn't been successful. Nothing worked. And they called Umesh and said, you, you have to come and help us. And <laughs> Umesh said, well, what can I do? I mean, he's not a shaman. He, uh, but they, they said, we're at the end of our rope. You have to come. We're exhausted. You have to help us. So he went with fear and trembling and went into the small apartment. And there was a woman making unearthly sounds in a, a man's deep, gravelly voice. <clears throat> and the friends were barely able to restrain her. Uh, such was her strength. 
and he was terrified, and there was an outburst that started, and so silently in his mind, you understand he didn't say this out, li out loud, silently in his mind, he began to think, Jesus, tell the demon to leave. Now, why would he do that? He had a few Christian friends, and he remembered that they always told him that Jesus had authority over the demons, that Jesus had power over the demons. And so it wasn't exactly that he had uh, strategically decided to test the theory. It just came to his mind that he should say that in his, in his mind to himself. He started thinking, Jesus, tell the demon to leave. All of a sudden, the woman started screaming, who's doing that? Who's calling to Jesus? Who's telling him to tell me to leave? He's telling me to leave. And she screamed, and the demon left. The friends were completely stunned. They had no idea what was going on. Shubas, or Umesh was, was shocked, and he didn't tell the friends. Uh, that would have opened up a whole other can of worms to tell his Hindu friends that he just called upon uh, the God of the Christians, uh, even, even though it worked. It, it wasn't a box that he was willing to open up, and so he never said a word. But he left, and he said, from that moment on, I know that Jesus is real, that Jesus is true, and that Jesus has the, author uh, the authority over the demons. But he still could not bring himself to step across and make a public profession of faith because in his mind it would mean cutting himself off from his family. When Umesh's family would gather together, they had all left the villages and they had moved into Kathmandu some years ago. And uh, Umesh says, when we gather together now, we can't meet in a home anymore. We have to, we have to hire a hall. There are 150 of us who gather. It's a large extended uh, family. And the idea of him cutting himself off from his family uh, and not receiving his father's blessing was abhorrent to him. And I told him it would be abhorrent to us as well. There's no reason for that. So he said to me, Father, you have to bring some people, some other Orthodox, and you have to start a church here so we can come and see. And I said, that's a good idea, Umesh. I'll have to think about that. But like the fathers at Vatopedi, I couldn't find anybody who would come either. And so when illness drove me away, that door seemed to be closed. Uh, it isn't entirely negative. When uh, I won't go into it, but I found myself in the hospital uh, yet again in uh, January 2015. And while I was there, I uh, got an email from uh, a young fellow, a young man in uh, Nepal. Uh, and uh, he's a missionary there. And he said, you won't remember me, but you met me in a coffee shop one time. I was working at a coffee shop. I gave you a cup of coffee. And uh, he explained that he had been uh, working with a, a Nepali church. They'd encountered a lot of problems. And in order to figure out how to address these problems, he started wondering, how did the early church address these problems? So he started a study of church history, which led him to orthodoxy. And he liked a lot of what uh, he saw, and he wanted to find out more. And he found my website. Uh, there's a, in fact, if, if you want to have a look at it, uh, it's orthodoxnepal.org. Um, and you'll see a lot more about uh, my time there in 2013-14. Uh, I wrote back to him and said, I actually do remember you. It was the first week that I had arrived in, in 2013. I went to a coffee shop where I could find some, a Wi-Fi connection and uh, got a cup of coffee, and this young fellow, who's an American, behind the counter said, what are you? And uh, I said, I'm an Orthodox priest. And he went, oh. And he went and got my coffee and gave it to somebody to give to me, and that was, that was it. And I was really disappointed that that's as far as it went. And I thought, well, maybe if I keep going back, you know, he'll keep asking questions. But then I moved to uh, Kumaripati, which was a little further away, and it wasn't convenient to come back. And coffee was expensive anyway. And uh, so I never saw him again. But I never forgot about him. And I was always frustrated that nothing had come of it. So we've been uh, corresponding weekly since that time. He's crossed the line and wants to become Orthodox. Uh, he and his family want to become Orthodox. Uh, pray for Tim and his family. It's, it's difficult. Um, if he lets this out, and he's, he has let out to the mission committee that he's looking into Orthodoxy, uh, they will cut off his finances. And he and his four children would be stuck in Nepal without finances even enough to come back. He's not sure how to become Orthodox, but he's absolutely determined to become Orthodox. So. Glory to God, some fruit has come from that. And uh, God willing, um, he, uh, he and his family will come into the church and maybe he'll go back. Maybe he'll go back with the team and be the one to start a, a church there. Thank you for your time uh, and your patience. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.